Hello and welcome to the Hush Blackwell Labor Law Insider Podcast. I'm Tom Godar, your host, and I'm glad that you've come along. In this podcast, we welcome guests with practical expertise and experience regarding labor law issues, and they share their insights related to this ever-changing area. The breadth of developments in laws related to unions and individual workers' rights that we are experiencing under the Biden-appointed National Labor Relations Board and led by General Counsel Jennifer Abruzzo is unprecedented. These developments demand that employers and those giving counsel to organizations stay tuned into these changes and make necessary adjustments to their practices and policies. When President Biden was elected, he promised to have the most union-friendly administration ever, and he is fulfilling that pledge. So buckle up and hang on for this wild and wonderful ride in the world of labor law. It is great to be welcoming you back to the Labor Law Insider. This is Tom Godar, your host. And today I'm joined by a veteran, uh, although a younger veteran, Adam Doerr, and my uh, good friend and colleague and uh, a veteran of labor law for many, many years, John Anderson. Uh, John practices in Wisconsin and is the leader of our Madison office, recognized all over the places. You know, one of the best lawyers and all that jazz. But uh, John has been terrifically helpful uh, to me, even in my uh, practices. It's great to bounce ideas off of him because of his broad experience. He's a product of the um, Marquette University Law School. And while I went to the UW Law School, we find a way to get along. John, welcome to the Labor Law Insider Podcast. Thanks, Tom. It's great to be here. I've uh, I put this off for so long, getting involved with this, that I thought it's time to give it a try. <laughs> and to deal with a topic that I, is near and dear to my heart, collective bargaining. Well, and we're going to have Adam Dorr join us as well. Adam went to St. Louis University and practices out of our St. Louis office. But uh, again, practices around the country. Uh, it's not unusual for Adam to be uh, in Chicago or Wisconsin or certainly uh, down in Missouri and Kansas and that area as well. I'm going to ask each of you to weigh in on this. But Give me a little bit of insight, Adam, uh, either a favorite story, a favorite insight from your collective bargaining over the uh, years that you've been practicing. Well, that's a good question. It's hard to pick one. They're all so different. And and I guess what I find so interesting about it is how every relationship, every situation is so different. You know, whether you're out state uh, negotiating an entire contract in two days without a single hitch or being dragged into a uh, a Death Star of union headquarters where you have every reason to be suspicious of sabotage and whatever else. So it's just always to me interesting of each each individual contract negotiations and in, in relationship is always interesting. That's terrific. And if you haven't already guessed, our topic today is going to be collective bargaining. I appreciate your your thoughtful response that every situation is different. John, insider story that uh, encompasses part of your career in collective bargaining. Well, I think Adam's right. Every bargain is different. Every bargain is unique in lots of respects. I think that it starts early in the process by working with uh, whoever you're working with, your client, and talking to them about the need to understand why the union's here, what they want, what their interests are, and then helping the employers understand that a collective bargaining agreement is a document of limitation. And uh, you shouldn't look to that agreement for the rights you have. You look to it for the rights you've given away. And that's something that if you spend some time on that at the beginning, it will help because many people don't understand that. They want to spell out everything in the collective bargaining agreement. And that is just not the way this process should work. And uh, it creates major problems when the people that you're working with don't understand the basics of the process. I'd give you a story, but it seems to me that I've forgotten more than I can remember at this point. <laughs> well, John, welcome. Adam, welcome. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's very interesting to be talking just about a nuts and bolts subject. We've talked so often about updates in labor law because of board decisions, and there hasn't been a lot of earth-shaking decisions regarding the nuts and bolts of collective bargaining. We're going to have more first-year contracts than we've ever had because Unions have been organizing so effectively over the last couple of years. The number of organizing campaigns goes up seemingly every month. I think 
Last I read, it was up 35% uh, year to year in terms of new contracts. So we're going to see that. But in a sense, collective bargaining is, as John said, a limitation. And it has the different than any other kind of bargaining. It's more like a marriage that is the relationship with the union than it is like buying a car. You can go to one car dealer or look online and, and choose the car that you want. But when you have a relationship with the union, it is a relationship. It's long term. These people come to work every day. The managers come to work every day. And much of that everyday activity is reflected in bargaining. One of the questions, though, I wanted to start out with is, how does an employer become obligated to bargain collectively? Is there anything new under the Biden board that introduces employers to unions? And Adam, why don't you go ahead and start out with that one? Sure, Tom. The, the traditional way the bargaining obligation arises is if the union wins an election conducted by the National Labor Relations Board. Another way is through voluntary recognition of a union. And more recently, the Labor Board has made that easier to do under its CMEX decision, where uh, an employer does not have to explicitly say, yes, we recognize you voluntarily. Instead, a company's mere inaction over the course of two weeks following a demand for recognition based on majority support, uh, that inaction alone will deem the employer to have voluntarily recognized the union and have every same obligation to bargain with it thereafter. A little bit different. And also, we have the opportunity, potentially, again, under CMEX, that if an employer engages in unfair labor practice or practices during the lead up to an election, even if the employees don't choose to vote by a majority or a union, the board is more likely today to impose that obligation than they were a year ago. And uh, we'll see how likely they are over time. But right now, it's a, it's a pretty substantial threat. Hey, John, one of the things that I was taught, you were taught, we were all taught, is that you have to bargain in good faith with the union. What the heck does that mean to bargain in good faith? I think it means sitting down with the union, the bargaining committees, and, and talking about wages, hours, and conditions of employment with the intention of reaching an agreement. The law is very clear that we don't have to reach an agreement. We don't have to make a concession if we don't want to. But it means sitting down in good faith, discussing issues that are brought to the table, issues that you have an obligation to bargain over, mandatory, or issues that you can bargain over, but you don't have to, permissive, and uh, discussing you know, what the terms will be of the document that we're working on, this collective bargaining agreement. How are we going to define our relationship in that agreement? And again, without any obligation to concede anything, uh, looking for common ground with the intention of reaching an agreement. You know, it, it was pretty typical if I or any of us were asked to step into a mature bargaining relationship to take a look at the collective bargaining agreement before we go into the renewal period. Maybe that's three months before the contract's expired. And we look for mandatory, permissive, and potentially illegal or improper subjects of bargaining. Adam, give me a real quick primer. What would be a permissive subject or an illegal subject in a contract? An illegal subject would be an improper waiver of future rights, perhaps, that an employee is just not allowed to waive or a union can't waive on their behalf. For example, if, you know, I hope this would never happen, but if a union asked the employer, if the employer asked the union to let the employer discriminate against a certain class of employees, that would be unlawful. There are certain other provisions that would be unlawful in certain contexts, cot cargo provisions and other provisions we could talk about. Permissive subjects are those um, that the employees and the employer are allowed to address but don't have to because they don't pertain to a material, uh, material term of their employment. Maybe how you're going to go and interview an employee for um, an employment and determining the terms of initiating that relationship of employment. Yeah, I think you've given a good one, Tom. Before somebody's employed, the process that you use to select people to come into the plant, that's all permissive. You don't have to bargain over that. Once they're employed, then obviously the terms and conditions have to be bargained. I was going to give a, a highway crew size. You're working a, a, a job construction project and the union says you got to have five people doing this job and you believe it's only three, 
and there's no safety issues involved. The quantity of labor that you use is typically going to be a management decision, so it's a permissive decision. As we walk towards these, it's always been described that you have to bargain over wages, hours, and working conditions. The wages seem straightforward, but it means anything that has an economic impact upon the employee. And the hours seem straightforward, but it has to do with overtime. It has to do with assignment. It has to do with a number of things and seniority being engaged in whether or not that person gets those hours. And finally, working conditions, the sort of broad catch-all that any sort of the relationship between the employer and the employees uh, that can affect the employee's working conditions. I just set that out as a sort of set it aside. That's what we're there to bargain about. But before you ever get to the bargaining table, you meet with the employer, whether it's the first time you've engaged with that employer or the 15th time that you're bargaining a, a two or a three year contract over a career. What kind of preparation do you normally ask the employer to help you engage in before you ever find yourself at the bargaining table? John, what kind of things do you want to talk about with the employer to set the stage for bargaining? I want to review what's happened in previous negotiations, especially if I've not been there. I want to know how things have gone. What are the issues? I want to review the experience that occurred under the current collective bargaining agreement, if it's a successor situation. I want the employer to um, to work with me in collecting data internally, chronology of wages over the last 10 years. Let's just see how the people have progressed. I want to know what the key economic factors are going forward. I want the age and service of the bargaining unit. You know, if the bargaining unit tends to be older, then issues relating to retirement and exit strategies become more important. I want to see any new policies or rules that have been adopted over the course of the existing collective bargaining agreement, just so I'm familiar with them. I also think that we should be getting information on external data, CPI, uh, comparable wages paid at competitors, for example, without violating any antitrust rules. But I think we need to know what the market is for this particular bargaining unit and the jobs that are in it and uh, going forward. And then, you know, you want to talk about what's your objective? What are you trying to do? What's the goal here? What do you want? And what's the end game so that we can determine how we get there? The steps of strategy are certainly related to the end game. And uh, when do you want this contract done? And, you know, what are you willing to do to get it resolved? And obviously, at this stage, we have no idea what the union is going to propose, although we do probably have some idea based on grievances that were filed and shop talk and, and things like that. But ultimately, it's, it's a, a matter of collecting data and preparation. Information and collective bargaining is power. And so get as much information as you can. I've never had too much. I've always had enough. And it's really important. And then, you know, as you talk about bargaining, you want to make sure that you're keeping people informed about the process and how it's going. And I typically write a memo uh, after each bargaining session, this is just me, that goes out to all employees, including employees in the bargaining unit, telling them what's happened at the table. Because I find that the union fails to do that. And I want to be known as the good source of reliable information. And when it gets to the point where if we have to go directly to the employees after the bargaining committee tells us no, I want them to know that we're providing them with good, solid information. And one of the things that you, you alluded to, and I guess I'll let Adam sort of uh, work with this, is you got to know how far the employer is willing to go, what's really important. Let's call it what it is. Are you willing to take a strike on this issue? Do you need to have a contract that actually costs less than the last contract, which might be so provocative that union might have the employees uh, say yes to a strike vote. Sometimes they have a strike vote before they've ever seen your first proposal, but leaving that aside, when you get engaged in these discussions, Adam, do you talk about strikes? Do you recommend, do you insist that there's a strike plan or only if it seems to be a provocative potential bargaining time? I think it's always important to be aware of the risk of a strike. I don't think that there's always the need to have robust strike preparations in place before going into contract negotiations. Sometimes we can reasonably anticipate that it's going to go relatively smoothly. There's not a real risk of a strike, whereas sometimes you know 
that there is going to be inevitably that threat come up and it's a realistic threat whenever it's made. So I think it's very important to have those conversations as John was talking about with the client to understand what his priorities are. We've seen a very wild four or five years of collective bargaining negotiations, including times where employers recognize they've fallen behind competitive wage scales. And we confidentially going in know that we need to maybe be putting five or 6% on the first year uh, to keep up and to hire and retain. And so sometimes we Every time we have to be cognizant of what the underlying goal is. Is it saving money? Is it helping hiring and retention? Is it avoiding a strike at all costs? Or, you know, whatever the case may be, we need to be approaching negotiations with that in mind and then armed with all the preparation that John was talking about. John, we had strike tower, didn't we, two years ago? Are we more cognizant of the potential of strikes in 2024 as that? the year um, reaches its midpoint than we were in the middle of 2022? I think we are. I think that there's nothing like a good pandemic to empower a union. And I think that I've kind of moved the dial a little bit up in terms of talking with my client about this. Are you prepared to take a strike? Are you, do you, you know, if they're producing things, have you got some stuff stockpiled so that we can continue to supply our customers during this time? But I think Unions are gaining strength and popularity, and certainly in healthcare, we're seeing some more strike activity than we have in recent years. Uh, and in other industries, it's not an issue at all, but I still think you have to have the discussion and check the box that you've had that discussion because, you know, and it doesn't have to be, are you ready for a strike? Uh, it's like, you know, how are you going to keep this place running if they decide to uh, to slow down for a bit? And I think it's important in Having that discussion is is critical as a part of a planning process. I've discovered two things. One, the first time I'm in bargaining with a union, even if it's a mature relationship, I have to be particularly thoughtful about how I and my committee are going to be communicating. And secondly, when I've had first contracts, fortunately, it doesn't happen very often. We're uh, pretty fortunate to work with clients that even when there's a union organizing campaign, most often, quite honestly, or almost always, it's not successful, but occasionally it is. And Or sometimes we're called in when someone else has uh, helped, but not successfully to keep a union at bay. Talk to me a little bit about that first meeting, a mature relationship, your first time in the meeting, or maybe with a group that has never had union representation before. Yeah, I don't want you to kick it off, and John, you can comment as well. It's always important to me to establish professional rapport. You know, we will always have disagreements along the way, but for me, it's important to establish relationships. If it's an established relationship in terms of the employer and the union, I want to make sure I'm fostering a productive, trusting relationship with the union representatives too. More often than not, employers appreciate that approach in mitigating risks of, of future disruptions and, and disputes. Sometimes an existing relationship is already existingly hostile. <laughs> and so you know that you're already having to walk a little bit of a tightrope and manage some or iron out some wrinkles. But my personal approach more often than not is one of trying to foster a productive, relatively trusting relationship, even though I know that we'll have disagreements and they won't always appreciate or agree with my perspective. Well, certainly we've all done this. If there's going to be somebody at the table that we haven't worked with before, we're going to go reach out to our colleagues. We're going to get a little bit of a book on what this person from the uh, AFSCME is like or what this person from the UAW or whatever it might be. And we might get reports that are not going to tell us everything, but it's going to be a little bit helpful. How about you, John? Any thoughts about going into, uh, particularly with a a new relationship, maybe um, an employer that's never had a union. What, how do you approach that first meeting? Well, I think a new relationship is, um, first, you have to educate your client as to what to expect and how you believe the bargain is most efficient. I want to be the spokesperson. I don't want anyone else to talk but me. I want, uh, you know, unless we've prearranged it in advance and talked about it in a caucus, I think that's pretty important. But I approach collective bargaining. I try to build a relationship that Adam's discussed here, a trusting relationship, knowing that we're not going to agree on everything, but 
I don't want to be viewed in any light other than straightforward and businesslike and professional. And sometimes it's hard, but uh, you, you want to be professional. So I, especially new negotiations with proposed ground rules to set the expectations so everybody knows where we're coming from and that we understand you know, what it means to sit down at the table and how long the sessions are going to be and where they're going to be and who's going to take notes or how we're going to take notes. Talk about press releases, talk about tentative agreement authority. As you develop that relationship, those ground rules become less important because you know what you're dealing with when you're in that second contract. But the first contract, there's a bit of unknown. And to the extent that you can try to address the unknown with proven rules that help to form that relationship, you're better off. It has been terrific, John and Adam, to have you with us to offer practical tips and insights into collective bargaining from the pre-bargaining preparations with employers all the way through to, well, how and when do you make strike preparations and how important is an issue to you? There's much more to cover. We could talk about in bargaining in a joint sessions. We can talk about bargaining after impasse has been reached and then you have to reopen the bargaining, but the employer's gosh darn not willing to give an inch. Maybe they're just going to restack where the chips sit on the table because otherwise every time you bargain, at least it's been my experience, they come back after having voted down the offer to say, I want more. But those will have to wait for another day. This has been really, uh, really fun. And I hope that our clients, those who are seasoned bargainers, picked up a tip or three. And those who are new to the bargaining table um, are going, ha, huh, that's what goes on inside that smoke-filled room. Well, at least it used to be smoke-filled. Thanks again for joining us at the Labor Law Insider. And thanks again, John and Adam, for your fantastic participation. Y'all take care.